Thanks for coming out. It's good to see everybody tonight. Uh, you know, when you go, he mentioned I went to uh, Trinity. When you take the preaching courses, they tell you, you know, start with an anecdote, a joke, warm people up or something. But we got a lot to get through, so we're going to jump right into it, all right? I'm just going to go right into it, our topics of discussion. We're going to talk about the origin of life, cellular complexity, DNA, the Cambrian explosion, consciousness, the origin of non-material entities. Yeah, here we go. Molecular machines, right? So that's a lot. So you see why I'm not doing the long introduction, right? And I'm going to talk about unanswerable questions, questions they can't answer with regards to these topics. All right. <clears throat> now, before you can discuss anything, you have to be able to, decide, to define it. And the problem is the word evolution is used in a number of different ways. All right, so here are a number of different ways the word evolution is used. You've got cosmic evolution, that's the Big Bang. Ken talked a little bit about that. Then you have what some call chemical evolution. I don't like that term. I use the term nucleosynthesis because they're talking about the origin of elements. And it's confusion, confusing because there is another type of chemical evolution that we're going to get to. So um, there's stellar evolution that talks about the origin of stars. Here, again, is chemical evolution. Now they're talking about the origin of life. So when I use chemical evolution, I'm talking about the origin of life. Other people are talking about the origin of elements. Um, but if I'm talking about the origin of elements, I'll be talking about nuclear synthesis. And chemical evolution is the origin of life. And then you have macroevolution. That's regular Darwinian evolution, the, the origin of species. And then you have microevolution, which is variation variations within a species. Now, out, out of all these kinds of evolution, only one has been observed. And that's the last one, variation. <clears throat> so, if we're talking about evolution, which one do we mean? Well, we're going to be talking about Darwinian evolution in specific. All right, so now, what kind of Darwinian evolution are you talking about, right? Because if you, if you speak with uh, evolutionists, if you're like on social media and you say, for when I'm talking about it, for instance, I'll be talking about particles to people evolution, right? You, you don't start with molecules and wind up with a person, right? Molecules to man, um, particles to people, that's the kind of evolution I'm typically talking about. But they'll say, do you even know what you're talking about? You don't even know what evolution is. Evolution is a change in the frequencies in the, of alleles in the gene pool over a population, which is one definition of evolution. Uh, here's Stephen Meyer. He's gone through and he's identified these six types of evolution. So when you're talking about something, you really need to define what you're talking about. I tend to talk about, as I said, particles to people or molecules to man evolution. And so when you're talking to an evolutionist, you need to say, this is what you're talking about. Or they'll say, you don't know what you're talking about. This is what evolution is. And they'll, they'll, they'll point to one of these other ones. You know, I'm talking about alleles, or I'm talking about limited common and descent. So it's always good to define. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about neo-Darwinism. Well, what's that? Neo-Darwinism is Darwinism with mutations added to it. Darwin did not know about mutations. Um, Mendel, he did his work after uh, Darwin did. Darwin published in 1859, Mendel, with his um, experiments on peas and how they express traits. He didn't publish until 1866. So neo-Darwinism is defined as the common descent of life, all life on Earth, from a single ancestor by undirected mutation and natural selection. So that's the mutations on top of classical Darwinism. Well, what's classical Darwinism? So this is Ernst Marst, and he's done a very good explanation of what classical evolution is. First of all, Darwin talks about the non-constancy of species. What is he arguing against? Darwin is really arguing against early creationists who said God created everything perfect, so there's a fixity of species. What, if you look out your window, you go to the zoo, the species you see then were the species that God created in creation week, and nothing has changed. So he's arguing and saying, no, you don't know what you're talking about. There's been a lot of change, and in fact, the early creationists who believed in the fixity of species, they had problems when they started discovering dinosaur bones. Why? Because they believed there was no extinction. Why? Because God created everything perfect. 
So how can you have extinct creatures if everything is perfect, nothing goes extinct? They had problems believing in dinosaurs. So Darwin is arguing, no, there's change over time. That's his major theory. But he goes on to say, not only that, it's all from a common ancestor. Um, it's gradual. There are no jumps in it. He calls that a saltation. So there's no jumps. It's very smooth. There's a multiplication of species. And it all happens by natural selection. So this is a summary of what Darwin is talking about. <clears throat> So now, can we agree with any of his theory? Well, non-constancy, the change of species over time. Actually, we can. Everybody acknowledges species change over time. You can look and see there are dinosaur bones. They're actually there. Species go extinct, so there is not a fixity of species. They do change over time. So now, if Darwin had stopped there, we'd all be Darwinists, and we wouldn't be having this meeting, right? But he didn't stop there. Why? Because Darwin wanted to get rid of God. He wanted to get God out of the picture. He was like Lyell, the lawyer turned geologist, who wanted, he said in separate communication, that he wanted to remove Moses from the science. In other words, he wanted to get scripture out of the picture of what happened in the past. Darwin wants to do the same thing. So we can't stop there. <clears throat> when you look at what he really means, what Darwin is actually talking about is species evolving across kinds, which is not what we see. That's not true. He talked about common descent, everything coming from a single creature. No. Scripture is very clean, clear. Everything is created according to their kind. And we'll come back to this. He said that evolution was very gradual. You don't see any jumps. Well, we can't agree with that either because there's no evolution, so there's no point in determining whether there are jumps or not. He said there is a multiplication of species. Well, now here you have to decide what he's talking about. Are you talking about across kinds? Then you'd have to say, no, that does not happen. For instance, <clears throat> evolutionists believe whales evolved from four-legged creatures. Darwin believed they may have evolved from a bear. He saw a bear swimming in a pond with its mouth open trying to get insects, right? And he thought, well, if it paddles along long enough and keeps its mouth open, then you know, given a million years, it'll grow the tail and extend the mouth and you get a whale. And he believed you would, you know, grow a whale from a bear. Uh, we don't believe that. <clears throat> now, if you're speaking of within a kind, then yes. So we, if you're talking about bears, you have polar bears and grizzly bears and black bears. So within a kind, yes, we see var variation, but we don't see variation across kind the way Darwin was talking about. What about natural selection? Well, no, not the way he's talking about. He's talking about using natural selection to, for instance, change bears into whales. That does not happen. But we do see natural selection used to have traits expressed. So when he went to the Galapagos and he saw the finches and the beaks changed, that was a change in a particular trait within a specific species that we do see. But we do not see, you know, whales from bears or um, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so we're talking about neo-Darwinism, the mutations on top of classical Darwinism. And a, f a few things we want to focus on as we look at this is what they keep saying. The undirected mutations, meaning they're not planned, they're random, they're accidental. Because evolutionists like to claim that evolution is not random due to natural selection. But natural selection cannot select until an unplanned mutation occurs. So it actually is, by definition, random and accidental. So let's look at this first unanswerable question. So in Darwin's day, his critics replied that, well, Darwin may have may, they weren't even sure, explain the survival of the fittest, but he did not explain the arrival of the fittest. So the first question is, what is the origin of life? How does life come about? <clears throat> so now they might give you a few possible answers. They might say, well, the origin of life is actually not a problem Darwin tried to solve. It's not part of his theory, and they'd be correct. Darwin starts with living creatures, that is true. But the other thing that is true is that they use evolution as an entire worldview, right? So when you look at Dawkins, for instance, what does he say? Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, meaning 
it provides you an entire worldview. And even Darwin tried to explain the origin of life, right? He's the one who came up with the warm pond, saying, well, life may have started in the warm pond, and you know, you, you get the sunlight and the chemicals and the time. Time is your hero, and you get life. <clears throat> so they actually do believe it's an explanation. Um, and if they try and explain it, then we come back to what we saw before, chemical evolution. They believe chemicals can become alive. That's what they believe. So how does that happen? What kind of theories do they get? Well, <clears throat> we'll look at some of these, and then I'm going to tell you why they don't work. So the first one, we'll look at Darwin's idea. Right? Darwin suggested the warm pond. Why does he think that would work? Well, he's got the basic formula. You've got the sun for energy. You've got chemicals in the warm pond. And then you get time, right? The millions of years. They're always talking millions or billions of years. So they think you put those three things together and poof, you have life. That's the evolutionist formula. Why won't that work? This is Jonathan Sarfati. He's with Creation uh, CMI. And he says any chemist wouldn't have water in the reaction because water tends to drive the reaction in the opposite direction towards the little molecules. So he's talking about the organic molecules, the ones that Ken works with, right? That uh, you need to build life. They start small and you have to make them bigger. Well, if you're trying to make them bigger, you don't want to put them in water. Yet the primordial soup would have inevitably had loads of water in it, so it is the last place a real chemist would try to make proteins or DNA. You've heard of Miller's experiments, Dan Miller. Now, there's all kinds of things wrong with it. I'm just going to run through it real quick, um, just so you have an idea of some of the problems with it. First of all, he had the wrong atmosphere. They supposed what the atmosphere was like. They assumed there was no oxygen in it, which was a handy assumption because, second problem, if they had oxygen, it would have ruined ex the experiment. But uh, they assumed there was no oxygen, so first of all, that was wrong. If there was oxygen, it wouldn't have worked. His experiment contained a trap to keep the contaminants out. They didn't have that. And then Dr. Ken has done a whole talk on this. Chirality, he mentioned it earlier. You would get a mixture of left and right-handed amino acids, which for life, as he was saying, if you were here at the beginning, you need left-handed amino acids. So I direct you to his talk <laughs> on the specifics. <clears throat> but so these are, this is just for starters on why that experiment isn't going to work. The conclusion that scientists have come up with is the inference that Miller's synthesis does not have a geological relevance has become increasingly widespread. In other words, it doesn't work. All right, so what else might they say? How else might life have started? Well, what about crystals? So here you have um, A.G. Karn Smith suggested crystals might have been the reason why, because they can replicate. And if you saw Expelled, you see Michael Roos there was one who also supported this idea of life by crystals. But that's a problem. Why is that? Because crystals use a complex structure and a complex formula for the replica replication. And you have to ask, well, where did that formula, where did that come from? What's the origin of that complex information? So other suggestions they've come up with, hot underwater vents, right? So they're called black smokers. And the reason that they think it's a good idea, so one, you've got the three elements. You've got the energy, the heat from the black smokers, right? You've got all the chemicals down there. And of course, then they add the time. The other benefit is that it's, protect, it's protected from the sun. Turns out the sun you know, gives out ultraviolet rays. Well, those ultraviolet rays are going to break down the organic chemicals that you're trying to make. But underwater, you're protected from that. Of course, we already saw water is a problem. The other problem is these hot smokers are actually too hot. They're too hot to sustain life. So they're not going to work. Then they found some other vents. They're called alkaline vents. Now, they're cooler than the black smokers. And another thing, they have these little pores, these little pockets that are right about the right size to create a cell. They believe, of course, life started with a cell. Looks something like that, this is the way it was depicted in one show. But that it assumes a lot of things, right? It assumes that you can get this complex structure. This is a very complex structure that we're looking at. 
And we're going to see problems with that, because we're going to be talking about cell complexity. So then another suggestion, panspermia. Now, Ken was mentioning this. They have these asteroids falling out of the sky, and they think they brought life. One of the proponents of that was Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA. Why did he think that? Well, you know, he's looking at this helical structure of DNA. He comes up with this theory that it contains coded information. He looks, he's looking at like, there's no way. There's no way that this came about accidentally. Now, he's a committed atheist, so what's he going to do? Well, if it didn't come from here, maybe it came from out of space. And so he proposed what they call directed panspermia. Some aliens put life here. <clears throat> Another one who held it was Fred Hoyle. He termed the coin Big Bang Theory. Here's another guy, Chris McKay. Now, you'll notice that these solutions don't really solve anything, right? That, that solution only moved the problem to another planet. It didn't actually solve the problem. And you'll notice that all of these origins, that all these solutions that evolution has come up with, they don't really solve the problem. They lead to another origin of something problem, right? So if you have the warm pond, what is the origin of that environment? What is the origin of the warm pond and the chemicals and all, all the things that are needed? If you look at the crystals, what is the origin of that complex information you need to replicate that crystal? If you're looking at alkaline vents, what's the origin of that first cell? We're going to look at some of the problems they have in forming that first cell. If you're looking at panspermium, okay, so what's the origin of the early alien life that brought it here or sent it here? So they haven't actually solved anything. They've just given you another origin of something problem. So let's look at the next unanswerable question. What is the origin of the cell? <clears throat> so <clears throat> the cell is a very complex structure, right? So Richard Sternberg, if you saw Expelled, Ben Stein asked him, if Darwin thought the cell was simple like a mud hut, what do we now know the cell is? And he replied, it's more complex than the Saturn V rocket. And this is a little video of the Saturn V taking off. The Saturn V, of course, took us to the moon. So comparatively speaking, that is, a, that is how complex the cell is compared to what Darwin thought he was dealing with. So it's a very complex structure. Right now, here's a picture just to show you some of the things in a cell that they would have to deal with to explain how the structure of a cell came about. And I'll just point out a few. So there you see the mitochondria. Mitochondria is the energy maker in the cell. There's a complex molecular machine in there called ATP synthase. Probably won't have time to take a look at it. Uh, I've got a slide on it, but we'll probably skip it because I've never been able to get that slide in. So <laughs> there's a very complex machine there. Um, then you have the nucleus that contains the DNA that has information. In the Not only does it have that complex structure, but there's information. We're going to look at the origin of the information. That's another problem. Then you have the cell membrane. I think the cell membrane is amazing, right? First of all, if you have all these structures within this cell, how did they all get there and close within this cell? And of course, within the cell, you have to have ke chemicals come in so it can change them into other things then come back out. So it's got to be permeable or semi-permeable, let the good stuff in and the stuff it wants out, out, and keep the bad stuff out. So that's a, another complex structure. Then you have all kinds of other things. The one I, I'll point out here is the Golgi body that's involved in completing the proteins that are made, then it assists in moving it to another part in the cell. So this is a very complex structure. And they're saying it just happened. It just came about, right? You have this warm vent and it has a hole and poof, you've got this complex structure. Does that make any sense? I don't think so. And yet, this is what they tell us. They tell us that the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. That's what they tell us. Here's another way he put it. Humans are simply the accidental aggregation of stardust in an amoral, purposeless, blind, pitiless, indifferent cosmos. Once again, 
It's all accidental. You can't plan it. You can't design it. And yet, they expect that these complex structures just happen. Here's Carl Sagan, Mr. Billions and Billions. The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. So what is he saying? He's saying there's no God. Once again, there's no God, no design, no purpose. So if that is the case, then how do you get this complex structure? I didn't draw this. This is their drawing of what they think a protocell looks like. And, if you, and as they explain it, what do they say? They say that the, those red pieces, those are energy producers. We know what the energy producers are. We just looked at them. They're mitochondria. They're very complex. They have this molecular machine going on inside of them. And they just appeared in your protocell. It has the cell nucleus. The nucleus has DNA, the information, the information you need for life. That just appeared. The cell membrane, how did that conveniently enclose all the things that you need and keep all the bad stuff outside? And of course, all the other things that you need, things to move proteins around, complete them, and so forth. They're telling you it just happened. It just came together with no planning, no design, no molds, no sequencing, nothing. And it all has to happen within a specific time frame, right? You can't have one part evolve a million years ago and another part evolve two million years up here and say it all happened. <clears throat> so here's a helpful way to think of it. Doug Axe, he's one of the intelligent design guys. He wrote this book called Undeniable. That's actually... <laughs> Uh, in refutation of Bill Nye's book, also called Undeniable. So Bill Nye is supporting evolution, and Doug X answers him and says, Undeniable, how bi biology confirms our intuition that life is design. So in his book, um, <clears throat> Doug X says, to give an, an analogy, by a rough analogy, if we liken a cell to a car, then the individual protein molecules within the cell like the individual mechanical parts of the car. Proteins are that crucial to life, okay? So the proteins are like the parts. Here's a high level view of a car, lots of parts, right? And the thing I wanna point out, these are, this is just a high level, right? There's complexity upon complexity, right? You can look at even smaller parts, right? You go inside and smaller parts and it gets more complex. So let's look at this. Complexity on complexity, and not only are they complex, they're put together with a purpose, right? So we're looking at this V8, and I'm not a mechanic, but um, I'll point out a few things. So here you have a piston head, right? You'll notice that the piston is attached to this piston rod. It's not attached, for instance, to the spark plugs up here or the valves. Why? Well, because you want the piston to absorb the energy that's coming from the burning gas. You're burning gas, right? It pushes down on the piston head. So that's got to be able to transmit the energy down to the crankshaft. The crankshaft's turn is attached to your transmission. The transmission is attached to the wheel. The wheel's turn to make the car go, right? So if you attach the piston, for instance, to your spark plugs, you've got a problem, right? If you attach it to your valve, you've got a problem. So all of this is put together with a purpose, with a design. You can't just haphazardly grab parts and put them together and expect them to work, right? It's all done with a purpose. And yet this is precisely what they tell us happened with these cells, right? They've got all these complex parts. This, they say that's in there. And yet they say they just came together like that. Do you believe they just came together accidentally without um, design, without purpose? So let's ask some questions here. First of all, how did the individual parts form? We're going to take a look at that. Remember, they have to form by accident. Now, if we look at a car, how many parts are in a car? There's about 30,000 parts in a car. How many parts? Now, we liken the um, proteins in the body to the parts. How many are there in a body? Well, there's about 100,000. So a body is obviously much more complex than a car, for starters. There, and these are all proteins of varying lengths. <clears throat> and according to evolutionists, each one of these 100,000 parts had to come by accident. You cannot design them. That's their theory. That's what they say. They can't be designed because everything 
is right an accidental aggregation right it's but no design no purpose so what's the chance of creating one just one you need a hundred thousand but what's the chance of creating just one by accident as they keep telling us it has to be so a short protein Doug X tells us is about 150 amino acids so he, he, Doug Axe tells us, among all the possible amino acid combinations, the probability of generating just one, just one short protein by mutation is roughly one in 10 to the 74th. Or one chance in a trillion, 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 trillion. That's a very small number. To put that in context, right, there's about 10 to the 65 galaxies, atoms in the entire galaxy. So it's worse than trying to find one atom in the entire Milky Way galaxy, right? These are, and those are stars you're looking at, those aren't even the atoms. <clears throat> so, I mean, when you ask them, how could this ever happen with the probability of generating just one short protein by mutation alone being one in 10 to the 74th is not enough time even in a 4.6 billion year old Earth, which of course we don't believe, but we'll give them their number. They say the Earth is 4.6 billion years old or so. Even in that time, you couldn't create it. How, how fast do mutations occur, right? It takes, you might get a few in a generation. We could give them a mutation every single day and it'd still only be 1.68 times 10 to the 12. It'd be nowhere near all the possibilities they need to go through. And that's just one protein, just one. And they need to create 100,000 of them. So how did it happen? So another thing we could ask, so, right, so Darwin's thinking the bear turned into a whale, right? So how does that happen? So now you need to have cooperative changes, right? So now the arm or the paw has got to grow into a flipper and with that change, right? So now the bone has to grow and the muscles have to grow and the veins and the arteries have to grow and the ligaments have to grow, right? So you have all these cooperative changes, which means you need cooperative mutations. So how long would that happen? How, how easy is it to get a, a cooperative mutation? Well, they're exceedingly rare, as you might imagine. <clears throat> but let's suppose, and of course you'd have, before you can get a cooperative mutation, you have to get the first protein, right? So let's assume they get the first protein, even though they not, never would. But let's assume they had the first one. Now they have to mutate it into one that's helpful for something else. And they have to do it without planning, without purpose, right? Because every, everything is an accident without design. So how long is it going to take to get just one cooperative mutation out of the thousands of proteins that they need? So they've taken a look at that. This is Richard Sternberg again. He applied the math of Cornell University's researchers to determine the amount of time to get a single, one single cooperative mutation. And so to get one mutation, it, it takes more than 100 million years or a million centuries to get one, all right? <clears throat> so let's, let's, let's apply that to whale evolution. Uh, they suppose, as I said, that whales evolved from these four-legged creatures. They don't know which one, right? So they have this generic term. It's called an artiodactyl, right? That's any generic four-legged creature that might have become a whale. They don't know if it was a hippo. Darwin thought it was a bear. You see all these animals. They don't know what it was. They don't even care. They just say it evolved from some four-legged creature. So <clears throat> they believe it took 19 million years. So here's Richard Dawkins. And he's explaining how you get from starting this four-legged creature, a whale. And he's saying, so 55 million years ago, you had this, and then it evolved into this creature called Pakasitas, the whale of Pakistan, they, so they say, which then evolved into Rhodocetus, which then evolved into Dorudan, which is actually a whale, because it has the flipper and it's got the hind leg, or the flippers for legs and the tail. <clears throat> now, when you look at this, this is all made up. Because when you look at the actual fossil evidence, they started with just the head and like the back. They didn't actually have the hind legs. So what did they do? They thought it was a whale, so they just put on a whale's tail. 
<laughs> they just made it into whale. And later on, they found more of it. They found the paws for all four legs and the tail. And they said, oh, this is not a whale at all. In fact, it's a fast running creature. It runs so fast, it only runs on the tip of its toes. So they figured out later that, of course, it's not a whale, but this is, this is what they do. They, they make these guesses and they make, they make up stuff. But anyway, my, my point being here is from 55 to 36 is 19 million years, right? So <clears throat> remember, we're talking about the mutations that are necessary. They all have to happen by accident, right? You get one cooperative mutation every 100 million years, right? Thousands are necessary, and they've got 19 million years to do it, right? That's what Dawkins just told us. 19 million years to go from a four-legged creature to the whale. And you're getting one cooperative mutation every 100 million years. How's it going to happen? It's not. <clears throat> so questions. How can you get the thousands of necessary parts if you can't even create the one within the time frame of the lifespan of the Earth, much less have one mutate into another muted needed part at the rate of one cooperative mutation every 100 million years. And in the case of whales, you only got 19 million years to do it in. You don't have all these hundreds of millions of years to do all these mutations. So the obvious conclusion is, given their own limitations, that it's an accidental aggregation, because that's what they keep telling us, it's all an accidental aggregation, it's not planned, it's not designed, you can't even create one part of the needed 100,000 parts. So let's go on. We'll look at another question. What's the origin of the information in DNA? So we talked about Francis Crick, right? One of the co-discoverers. He had this sequence hypothesis. Essentially, he's saying that DNA contains coded information. All right? The DNA functions as a library. So when your cell needs to create a particular protein, it goes to the library, the DNA, and it looks up that section, it gets that information, and it gets transcribed, and they make the protein. And it's very interesting, right? Because the information is one-dimensional, and the protein is folded into a three-dimensional shape. Another complexity, I'm sure, that they don't understand. But the point is, it's all, uh, the information is in DNA, and it's coded in the DNA. Of course, evolutionists will deny this, right? If you go on social media, right, DNA is not coded information. Never mind what Francis Crick says, it's not that. Here's another guy. DNA is not coded information. Now, why do they deny this? Even though scientists believe that it is, why do evolutionists deny it? Well, some. Well, first of all, what do you need for a code? You need somebody to create the code, right? You need somebody to uh, encode the information. You need a way to decode it. And of course, you need the information that has to be encoded. All those things require intelligence. And once you have intelligence, you're back to a designer. So most evolutionists want to deny that DNA contains coded information. But that's, that's the basis of uh, Crick's hypothesis. So what do they say? What is their explanation? Well, it's all just part of the laws of chemistry, right? It's just, you know, it's a double helix. It's just a chemical chain of chemicals. It's an accident. It's nothing special. That's what they'll tell you. What they don't understand is you could, for instance, look at a book. In the book, the pages are not the information. And the ink is not the information. It's the sequence of the letters formed in the ink that convey the information, and the, it's in a particular code. So here we have the book of Genesis. Over here, if you, if you understand the code, which is English, and if you can read English, you understand it. it says here, and God said, let the water attain but living creatures, or over here, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's all coded information. What is the, <clears throat> how is it understood? It's not understood just because you dumped ink on the page. It's understood because the ink is formed into specific characters, and the characters are in a specific sequence. And it's that sequence that conveys the information. This is precisely what Crick, Crick said, that the chemicals of the double strands are not the information. It's not the bases themselves. 
it's the sequence of the bases that convey the information. It's the sequence. So what is that source of the information in DNA? Stephen Meyer says, at present, there is no naturalistic explanation, no natural cause that produces information. Not natural selection, not self-organization principles, not pure chance. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Scott Harden last month gave a talk on this, by the way, on information theory. Excellent. I recommend you watch it because he explains why all this is true. Right? So I'm just going to mention it, but he goes into it in detail on why this is true. Meyer goes on to say, based on the uniform and repeated, our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning about the past, there is only one cause for the origin of information, and that cause is intelligence. So Darwinists will tell you, oh, it's natural selection, natural selection. No, no. There's no cause, no material cause of information, and Dr. Harden went through it last month worthwhile looking at. <clears throat> so our next, next question, what is the origin of the body plans evident in the Cambrian explosion? So this is the geological column. Evolutionists believe the geological column consists of creatures buried over millions of years, you know, whose fossils we can now dig up, and that basically it's a record of the life that's been on Earth. They have a problem, though. There's an explosion of different types of creatures starting at the Cambrian level. So down here, you see the trilobite. Every time you see the Cambrian, they tend to show the trilobite because that's the index fossil for the Cambrian. Interestingly enough, they show this. You recognize that? It's a jellyfish, right? The Cambrian layers are supposed to be 540-some million years old. What are they saying? They're saying jellyfish have not changed in 540 million years. They believe they got a whale in 19 million years, but jellyfish haven't changed in 540 million years. There's a problem right there. But that's not the problem we're looking at. We're looking at the problem of how did those plants get there, right? Initially, they thought all the body plants were there. This one evolution said all the known body, animal body plants seem to have appeared in the Cambrian radiation but more recently, they say it's a defensible statement that most of the major body plants are present in the Cambrian explosion. That's where they first appear. That's Paul Nelson, one of, another one of the ID scientists. So here are some of the things that you'll see in the Cambrian. This is a popular one that, that they like to show. <clears throat> um, Anomalocaris, Opabinia. That's not as popular, but also an interesting one. So these we don't see today, but we see worms, right? We see fish. There's, again, the ubiquitous uh, trilobite. These are all in the Cambrian explosion. These are all very complex creatures. In fact, trilobites have among the most complex eyes in any creature anywhere. They're very complex. Um, so it's supposed to be the lowest level, which means it's supposed to be the simplest. Problem is, there's nothing before them, nothing gradually evolving into them. And this was one of his main theories, right? It all happened gradually without jumps, without saltations, as he said. So the problem is there's no evidence of multiple creatures below here. Underneath the Cambrian, there's almost nothing, right? So you're, according to Darwin, you should see all these increasingly complex creatures, but you don't. All you see is this explosion of life there at the Cambrian level. They just suddenly appear. And again, Darwin said, you know, nature takes no sudden leaps. He had that famous Latin phrase, natura non facet saltus, no jumps. Nature doesn't take jumps. Or as Dawkins put it, without gradualness, we're back to a miracle. Uh, yeah, that's right. We are back to a miracle. And when you look at the fossil evidence, the evidence, if you're just looking at the evidence, it supports creation, right? So this is what Darwin expected. He expected to find a single creature here at the bottom, and then the creature would get increasingly more complex, and it would branch off, and then you would get other creatures like, you know, apes and humans and 
what is that, uh, triceratops and lizards and other things. That's what Darwin expected, but that's not what we see. What we see is a number of distinct creatures from the beginning, all different kinds, just like the Bible says, by the way, that God created according to their kind. And from their kinds, we see variation within the kind, right? You might have this lizard, and then you might have variations within the lizard. Same thing with the birds or dogs. All kinds of dogs, but they're all dogs. They vary within their kind. We don't see them starting here. We see all these creatures all at once, and then they change. So the fossil evidence actually supports exactly what God said. In the beginning, he created them according to their kind. That's what they call the creation orchard, by the way. But there's an even bigger problem for neo-Darwinists regarding body plants, right? Because they believe the changes, the information comes about through mutations, right? Problem is, body plants, as far as we know, is not in the DNA, is what Jonathan Wells tells us and others. What, what does that mean? Well, that means that no amount of mutations is going to create a new body plan for you. So where are you going to get the new body plans? You can make all the mutations that you want. You're not going to get a new body plan. Why? Because DNA doesn't control body, body plans. So natural selection will never have a new body plan to choose from because DNA can't create them. They can't create it. So here's some questions. So first of all, how do you explain that the fossil evidence points to a sudden appearance? No gradualness, one of Darwin's main points. And yet we see all these multiple creatures appearing at the same time in the Cambrian layers. How do you explain that they appear according to their kind, right? They have this top-down, by, by kind, appearance in the fossils, not this bottom-up, where you have a single creature, and then Darwinian's tree of life, as they call it. They call that the Darwinian tree of life, when you have a creature at the bottom and then branching up. <clears throat> we don't actually see that in the fossil record. And then the problem, how do you explain the different body plans when neo-evolution has no mechanism for creating different body plans? Because it's not in the DNA, so you can't mutate it. You can't mutate yourself into a new body plan. No amount of DNA mutations is going to get that. All right, let's look at our next question. Our next question is consciousness. What is the origin of consciousness. So here's um, Robert Kuhn. He is a neuroscientist. He, he had a show called uh, Close to the Truth, and he's explained it as this way. He looks at the experience of consciousness. Consciousness is what mental activity feels like inside, the private inner, ex inner experience of sensation, emotion, and thought. Another neuroscientist, this is David Eagleman, says consciousness is that thing that flickers to life when you wake up in the morning. Successive levels of, of, of abstraction of all the machinery, machinery running underneath. So he looks at it as, you know, the CEO of a company, he sees the big picture, the, you know, 30,000 foot picture, as they say. He doesn't know what's happening in every department and every um, division in his company. He just sees the big picture. And consciousness is like that. You may not know what's going on in every cell of your body, but you, know, you have an overall sense of what you as the creature is experiencing. <clears throat> so where does it come from? Well, evolutionists have the same problem with consciousness as they have with the origin of life. Uh, material objects aren't alive. Material objects are not conscious, yet Evolutionists have come up with the same an impossible answer for both because we, being material, uh, material objects, are both alive and conscious, so they have to explain that. So what's their explanation? They say consciousness is an emergent property. The prevailing consensus in neuroscience is that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain and its metabolism. So basically, this is the same answer that they give before, right? It just happens, it just, emerges. it just emerges. It's essentially the same answer that they have for the origin of life. What's their answer for the origin of life? Well, you have heat, chemicals, and lots of time, and life emerges. 
What's their answer for consciousness? Well, you have a complex creature, you give it enough time and consciousness emerges. It's the same answer. <laughs> this is uh, one guy who specifically says that, uh, Jeremy England, that life is just what chemicals do, basically. And in fact, that's almost the title of that second episode of Cosmos. Um, Cosmos, a space-time odyssey, some things that molecules do. We're, I think we'll take a look at that near the end. <clears throat> but they think it just happens. Well, why is this a problem? If we look at an uh, explanation from Anthony Flew, so he was a very, very well-known atheist at the end of the 20th century, right? Well-respected for his arguments. But he abandoned his atheist. Atheism became either theist or deist. Why? Well, he started looking at the actual evidence. He started looking at things like the structure of DNA and the information that's contained in it and the origin, what's the origin of consciousness. And he started considering things like, how do you get rationality from material objects? And he came to the conclusion, there is a God. And he wrote that book, There's a God. <laughs> so he, he gives this nice illustration. He says, let us perform a thought experiment. Think for a minute of a marble table in front of you. Do you think that given a trillion years of infinite time, this table could suddenly or gradually become conscious, aware of its surroundings, aware of its identity the way you are? It is simply inconceivable that this could happen. And the same goes for any kind of matter. Once you understand the nature of matter or mass energy, you realize that by its very nature, it could never become aware, never think, and never say I. And I think he makes a good point. But nevertheless, that doesn't stop evolutionists. They like depicting material things as alive. Here's an example, right? iRobot, you may have seen this. All right, so you have this robot or android named Sonny. He is given all the characteristics of a living person, right? He feels, he dreams, he makes art, he makes music. And he can even do some things that people can't do. He apparently has prescient abilities. Right? He, he makes this prediction. He, he draws, right, something that everybody can do. But he draws this picture of his dream. And then later, the hero, Will Smith, the bionic guy, he's there to see it happen. So not only does he do everything that people do, he's got some kind of foresight into the future. Anyway, that's just science fiction, right? That doesn't actually happen. <clears throat> but they actually believe that, you know, these things can come alive. A good way not to be confused or to identify this is what is called the Turing test. The Turing test is you have this human interacting with a system. And the question is, can the human determine whether the responses generated are coming from the machine or if they're coming from a person, right? He doesn't know, but can he determine from the responses itself which one it is? This was developed by Alan Turing, a computer scientist, mathematician, logician, crypto analyst. Right? He conceived of the variable programmable computing machine. We now call that a computer. Right? So in the days when people just had like calculators that did one thing, and that's all you would think about, he conceived of a machine that you could program to do anything you wanted to do. And there you have an early IBM machine and the programs you used to program it. So he's considered the father of artificial intelligence. In fact, he was the subject of the movie The Imitation Game about decrypting the Enigma code during World War II. It's a good movie, by the way. But anyway, the point is <clears throat> androids that can pass the Turing test are popular in sci-fi movies. You see them all the time, right? Uncanny, Ex Machina, Westworld, Vice, The Terminator, right? for you Trekkies, Data, and Star Trek, right? These are all machines. If you were just interacting with them, you couldn't tell they were machines if you didn't know they were machines. That's the point. That means they're passing the Turing test. But don't be fooled. Complexity is not consciousness, right? Complexity alone did not give life to this cell. Neither does complexity give life to this rocket. Do you think the rocket is alive? It's very complex. Do you think it's conscious? No. So this rocket is very complex, but it's neither alive nor is it conscious. 
But that's the confusion that lots of people make when you have something like data. They think because he looks so complex and he acts so human that maybe he's alive and maybe he's conscious, but that is not the case. A good way to think about it, David Chalmers, an Australian philosopher and cognitive scientist who specializes in this area, says <clears throat> about this, you can know all about the physical processes in the world, in the brain, and not know about consciousness. Somebody could know about every last neuron in the brain involved in, say, color processing, but that wouldn't tell them about the experience of seeing red. My own view here is there's a principled gap here. Neuroscience gives a structure of the brain and dynamics of what we do, and that's all it's ever going to give us, right? More and more structure, more and more dynamics, more and more behavior, and that's always going to leave, in principle, a gap to consciousness. In other words, you can understand what's happening. You can understand what's happening at the physical level that doesn't tell you what's happening to make consciousness. That's his point, and I agree, right? <clears throat> but is there evidence that there is consciousness that exists apart from physical, from the physical? I think there is. The double slit experiment that was first done about 100 years ago. So the experiment is you have the slide source behind this double slit. I mean, what do you think you're going to get on the other side? You're going to get just two slits of light? That's what you would expect, right? But that's not what you get. What you actually get is called a diffraction pattern. So you get multiple slits. You see over here, and why is that? That's because wave act, or light acts as a wave, and waves interact with each other, so they can cancel each other out. And when they cancel, you get a dark spot, or they can interfere and make them stronger, and you get a light spot. So you get this alternating light and dark pattern. It's called a diffraction pattern, and it demonstrates that light behaves as a wave, right? <clears throat> so now, that's at a macro level, but when you do this at a quantum level, it's a little different. So it seems that when you do this at a quantum level and you have consciousness observing it, there's a difference, right? So when you're not looking and you're looking at the actual electrons or the photons, they now have the ability to do that. And when you're not looking, it acts like a wave and you get the diffraction pattern. But when you look at it, it's now acting like a particle and you get the two distinct groupings that you initially expected. Well, why would that be? That's very strange. So, and this is true regardless of when you look. So they've done other kinds of experiment, right? So they've done it so that they're not looking until after it goes through the diffraction pattern. And here you see the scientist is looking with his eyes closed. That's supposed to be closed eyes. And as soon as he opens his eyes, they, they look like particles. If he closes them again, it looks like a wave. They have no explanation for this. This is called the quantum enigma. What I think it points to is that the non-entity, non-material entity called consciousness is affecting the material. We have a non-material entity, just observation affecting the material world. But of course, we already knew that, right? Scripture tells us that. Second Corinthians chapter 5 says that we are confident that if we are away from the body, we're at home with the Lord. So if you <clears throat> go home to be with the Lord, even if you're not in your body, you're consciously aware. You know what's going on. You're with the Lord. Scripture told us that, what, 2,000 years ago? <laughs> so this is not news if you're a Christian. Uh, next question. What is the origin of non-material properties evident in living material human beings? So as humans, right, we have language, we have morality, we have reason, logic, consciousness, all these non-material things. Well, we can consider from a couple of perspectives, right? Like the marble table. The marble table is not, never going to have any of these things, right? It's never going to be able to talk, or it's never going to be moral or immoral, at reason, any of those things. But what about data? Right? Data looks kind of complex. Even if you think data has language and morality and reason, is that actually data, or is that just data the Android passing the Turing test and fooling you, right? I think it's just the Turing, being able to pass the Turing test is so convincing that you think he has these things, but he doesn't actually. Data is not conscious. Remember, complexity does not mean consciousness. More importantly, for you Trekkies, we know that data was designed, right? Star Trek told us he was designed by Dr. Noon Yen Sung. So even Star Trek is not foolish enough to say that something as complex as a data came about by accidental 
prop properties or purposes. <clears throat> there are two approaches you could look you could take to looking at this, right? So you've got Anthony Flew's thought experiment with the marble table, or you can approach it, which is probably even more convincing, by the information theory that we talked about earlier, right? So there's nothing like um, <clears throat> material processes, random chances, natural selection, none of that thing can create information. Same goes here. You can look at um, information theory and determine that there's no way, oops, that you could get consciousness out of that. <clears throat> um, again, I'll refer you to a uh, presentation last month, Worthwhile, where he starts talking about material objects cannot produce non-material entities or ar artifacts. Key point there. All right, we'll look at our last question here. What is the origin of molecular machines? There are lots of molecular machines that exist. Uh, some are in the body. One is kinesin. Another one is ATP synthase. We talked about that being in the mitochondria, producing energy. Another one is the bacterial flagellum motor. You've probably seen that because they talk about that a lot in intelligent design circles. But let's just put it in context. Let's understand the problem. <clears throat> So if you may have noticed as we've gone through and looked at these quotes that evolutionists keep calling us stardust, right? They really think we're stardust. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the host of Cosmos says, we're not figuratively, but literally stardust, all right? Hawkins said humans are simply the accidental aggregation of stardust in an amoral, purposeless, blind, pitiless, indifferent cosmos. And then Mr. Billions of Billions, Carl Sagan said, we are star stuff. So why do they keep calling us star stuff and stardust? <clears throat> why is that? <clears throat> well, if you take their theory, this is uh, that's a depiction of the Big Bang. Of course, they have a problem here, right? There's no way to get this thing started off. So I gave them a little help. I gave them a fairy for their fairy tale <laughs> to kick the whole thing off. So there's your fairy that's doing this singularity, right? Because you can't get nothing from nothing, right? They say that uh, what, 13.7 billion, 14 year, billion years ago, there was nothing, and then the nothing exploded, and all the time, energy, matter that will ever exist just popped into existence, all right? And then there was this inflationary period. They can't explain that either. That doesn't make any sense. And <clears throat> it goes on from there. Uh, and here, then, what did the Big Bang produce? Actually, Ken mentioned it earlier, if you were here, you get helium and hydrogen out of the Big Bang. 74% hydrogen, 24% helium, and as he mentioned, trace amounts of lithium. That's all you get. So where did all these chemicals come from? Ken talked about that at the beginning of our talk. Well, they believe they get cooked up in stars. So you get this hydrogen and you compress it down. They don't know how that happens. But if you compress it down to until it gets to about 100 million, years, 100 million degrees, you kick off nuclear fusion. Once you have nuclear fusion, you have a star. And once you have a star, then you can get what I called nucleosynthesis, right? This is the generation of chemicals. So once you get the stars, then you can get, generate the other chemicals, and then the stars explode, right? They go nova, and then they blow all that stuff into space. Then you have the nebular hypothesis, which creates the galaxies and the planets. Then once you get planets, then you can go on to your warm pond from Darwin. So that's why they think we're stardust, because all that stuff was cooked up in the Big Bang. But <clears throat> so here we are, nothing but stardust. And then our stardust, we have these machines. One of them is called kinesin. This is one that Neil deGrasse Tyson talked about in this episode of um, <clears throat> Cosmos, and I'll play this for you. Our sheet of the imagination is now so small, you could fit a mirror with it into a grain of sand. See those guys over there strutting along the dirt? They are proteins called kinesin. These kinesins are part of the transport crew that's busy moving cargo around the center. How 
So it's always amusing, right? I, I showed in the Big Bang Theory all the things they can't explain. Here's another thing they can't explain. They will acknowledge something happens, but they can't tell you how or why it happened. <clears throat> so description is not explanation. Just because they can describe these things that are in your cell doesn't mean they can explain how or why they're there. But they do this all the time. They do it all the time. They explain what they, they explain and they say it's evolution, but they give no evolutionary process that can create it. <clears throat> Watch for that error every, anytime you talk with somebody you're talking about uh, evolution, right? The complexity of the cell. How did that come about? Where did that come from? You know, these kinesin or kinesin, however you pronounce it, <clears throat> where did they come from? How do, you, how do you create that within an evolutionary worldview where everything is accidental and nothing is, is planned? Watch out for words like could or maybe or might have, right? That's the words they always use to say, to explain their theories. Well, could have been or might have been, perhaps this. That means they don't know, that's what that means. <clears throat> So here's some other ones. Since we're really running out of time, we're not going to look at these. We're just going to look at the requirements to create these, right? These are complex machines consisting of complex parts. So once again, we have complexity upon complexity. Once again, all the parts have to exist at the same time. You can't evolve one a million years here and then another one up here and another one way over there. If they're not all there at the same time, it's not going to work. And then they have to be properly assembled, right? You cannot just throw th stuff together and expect it to work. They have to be assembled in the proper order and in the proper way for them to work. Just like for this engine that we looked at, right? You can't just pick up some dirt and throw it in a, in, in a pile together and say, oh, I now have an engine that's going to work. Even if you take parts, known car parts, and you just throw them together, they're not going to work, right? You must assemble them properly in the right order, in the proper way for it to work. It's the same thing with these molecular machines. They're called molecular machines because they are, in fact, molecular machines. They're machines. They have to be done correctly. <clears throat> so if we're just stardust, how can evolutionary account for these complex molecular machines, which exhibit all the hallmarks of design and purpose and foresight? all of which evolution denies, right? They keep telling us it's all an accident. It's all without purpose. So just to summarize where we've been, what is the origin of life? From our perspective, or the real answer, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God breathed into the man, into his nostrils, the breath of life. Thus, the eternally living God is the origin and the creator of life. What's the origin of cellular complexity? Well, life, even the simplest life, like that cell we looked at, is very complex. So once God determined to give life in his wisdom, he knew the deep complexities needed to support that life. So God, the all-wise God, is the origin of cellular complexity. What about the origin of the information in DNA? Life requires information, right? We saw that there is no source of information except for intelligence. Information requires an intelligence. So when God decided to grant life, he used his infinite intelligence to bring it to pass. Thus, the all-knowing, immortal God is the origin of information in DNA. What about the origin of the body plans in the Cambrian explosion? The history of life is recorded in the pages of scripture. They're not in the layers of the geological column, right? The geological column is a record of things that were buried in the flood. It's not a record of life on Earth. <clears throat> so the body plans evident there were all created during the creation week. Therefore, God, who is a lover of diversity, who gives every good and perfect gift, is the creator of the body plans evident in the Cambrian explosion. What's the origin of consciousness? Well, God has revealed himself as the word, right? Thus, he indicates that words and their ability to express ideas and concepts originated in the divine consciousness. Therefore, God, the living word, is the origin of consciousness capable of understanding his words and his concepts. What's the origin of non-material entities like logic and language and love? <clears throat> well, God speaks through his word, <clears throat> and he tells us, God is spirit, God is love, right? <clears throat> Come, let us reason, Isaiah says. 
God is holy. All these are non-material things. So it's clear that God, who himself is non-material, <clears throat> he's an invisible spirit, is the origin of all the non-material properties of life. What is the origin of molecular machines? Well, the God who hangs the earth on nothing for us to live on and makes and directs the currents of the sea, which are necessary for the bio biological life and effects of the climate, also made the molecular machines necessary for life. Thus, the, the all-powerful God and the giver of life created the molecular machines necessary for life. So, that's a God worthy of praise, right? No one to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Scripture properly says that. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.